Okay, um, it's my privilege to welcome you to a new venue for us. Uh, many of you who are attend here regularly know that uh, this is a time of up, fruit basket upset for the University Church, but uh, we're delighted that we're, we've got a nice amphitheater here and uh, facilities are set up. We're also delighted that we have a guest speaker with us today. Uh, our first tower will be taken up by Professor McIntosh from the University of Leeds in England. And to tell you a little bit more about him, before we start, I'm going to turn to um, our special uh, introducer that we always get here, Randstetter. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Uh, this may seem to some of you like a, a new place for the Hart Sathabas School. In fact, it's an old place because I can remember, as many of you can remember, the years when our much revered professor of theology, Graham Maxwell, held his Sabbath school here. And um, so it's an old place. The only other thing here this morning that's older is Dr. Ariel Roth. But <laughs> glad to have you here, Dr. Roth. <laughs> It's my pleasure to introduce our visitor today. He, uh, he may be under some misconception about where he is going to speak. Dr. McIntosh, you're very welcome. Uh, let me tell you who he is anyway. He is no ordinary professor. Professor of, um, of thermodynamics and of combustion. So you see, it's his job as a teacher to set things on fire. <laughs> and that's why he came to California just a few days ago. I spent two days with him and other, others who are passionate about the, the, the doctrine of creation. We met up in the mountains above here and had a wonderful time together. And just by being close, I quickly realized that Professor McIntosh is not just an academic, but he's a man who, who is close to his God. He, uh, he is quasi-retired today. He still does some teaching at the University of Leeds, but more of his energy and time is spent teaching in the area of uh, faith and science, and that is, uh, he is a stout defender of biblical creation. And when I, when I got that perception of him, I said to him one day, this was at a conference at Cornell University on the subject of biologic information. That's another subject altogether. But uh, I heard his testimony there, and I said, any time you're in California, you must visit Loma Linda. Friends, you've got to be careful what you say sometimes. It might, might come to pass. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. So we welcome him today. This is, this is uh, Andrew McIntosh, professor of everything at the University of Leeds. And uh, we welcome you today, sir. Thank you, Professor. Just before he starts, uh, I just want to tell you, like every good speaker, he has also been a good writer. He has written books, he has produced DVDs and things, and wherever he goes, he takes those things with him, because those things often will speak to his subject after he has gone. He has brought a selection of things down here, some books, not all of them by himself, and some DVDs and other things. And should you be interested in seeing what uh, he has felt was worth offering to you, then they are down here on the front table. And uh, he is not selling them, but let me tell you, he has, he has to pay for them himself. So uh, if you wish to come and help yourself to whatever is down here, uh, there is a thank you offering box. You. Uh, you understand, uh, and he would welcome uh, anything that uh, you choose to put on uh, in that in that nut 
container. And the approximate value of these things is marked on them. And it's up to you. We're not selling them. He understands we're not doing business in the temple today. But, uh, but if you take them all and leave nothing behind, friends, <laughs> his ministry will come to a sad end. <laughs> I'm not so, sure it will. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brownstater. I think uh, you are inimicable. There is no delight you. And uh, it's really lovely to have got to know you in these last two years. And uh, I count it a real privilege to come to the Adventist uh, Church. And uh, I extend my warm appreciation for the stand that you have taken uh, over the years. And uh, it means a lot to us. And I was talking to Dr. Ariel Roth, whom I've only just met just a few moments ago, and his kind wife, Lenor. And uh, he, I, I was saying, it, you know, it was wonderful, that video that was produced, um, I think back in the 1980s, which is now a DVD. And um, that sort of ministry that has come out of the Adventist Church has been very, very helpful to the creationist community. And it's been a privilege to mix with some from the uh, Geoscience Research Institute and also, of course, from the biological and paleontology um, department as well, and, uh, and to get to know some in the Loma Linda University. So I think you're doing a tremendous service, and I mean that, to the Christian community, because you're taking a biblical stand, which is so important today. I'm still getting a little bit of feedback. I wonder whether it can just go down a bit, sir. Just, I'm used to speaking in the open air in England. And so actually I could speak without amplification. <laughs> so it may be my voice is a little bit loud for the amplifier. But uh, I'm getting a ringing, which means that there's a bit of feedback somewhere. I think it's a little bit better now. Thank you to Dr. Ken Hart as well, and Ron Daly. And uh, it's lovely to see Paul Guillen as well. I hope to get to know some of you a little bit more afterwards. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just share with you biblically b just a summary, really, of what, why it's important. Now, most of you are not going to have any problem with this. Biblically, why creation is important. Then I'm going to open it into one area where we need to use a biblical approach uh, to some of the science, and that I will come to at the end. But I want to sort of lay out before you why it's important. Most of you are not going to disagree with it, but you need reminding. I need reminding all the time as to why you can't just put this at the side of the plate. That one actually needs to uh, put, put something central in our thinking because they connect with the gospel. So why is creation important? You well know that the religion that most people believe outside uh, Loma Linda and outside the church uh, uh, the biblical evangelical church, those believers uh, who are your brothers and sisters right across the world, the religion that's believed is basically evolution. And it's believed very strongly in my country, slightly less strongly here, but increasingly so, as I'm sure you're aware. So I'm not going to play this clip that some of you will have heard actually um, when I played it the other day, some of you have heard my talks, but this is the sort of thing that's being said by a well-known atheistic biologist. His name is Jerry Kine. And he is saying things very, very strongly based on an evolutionary mindset. He is saying that we're not created by God. Well, you'd expect him to say that. Then he says, there is no special purpose for any individual, right? That's a very important point. So young people listening to Jerry Coyne and many other famous uh, evolutionists will get the sense that really they don't matter. They're just, they're just clumps of molecules which have just come about after a long process of evolution. And that sense of no value sometimes leads, as we well know, to those who have no God in their lives and who think that there is nothing of any worth in their lives. It leads to suicide for some. But then he says this last point. 
that morality and ethics is not based on Christian teaching. Even that is an evolved phenomenon. Now that's what's actually being trumpeted and like a juggernaut is being promoted in our institutions, the mainline high schools, the mainline state universities. That's what's being trumpeted. Shortly, next month, I'm going to be debating Don, Dr. Glenn Gerher and also a Dr. Walter Yan of the State University of New York. I'm not looking forward to it, but I know that that will be their philosophy. They're not so well known as uh, uh, this gentleman, Jerry Coyne. But that's what they will be promoting in the State University of New York. And right across the land, that's what's happening. And we need to be aware of what's taking place in the nation. And it's our job to have a firm basis to reach out to the nation. Briefly, I just want to share with you scripturally why it's so important. If we were to give way on this, and as I say, 99% of you here are going to agree with this. You don't, in a sense, I don't need to say this. But on the other hand, I need to connect what you all know to what we should be doing in the world outside and using the information that we know from the Bible to reach out. So it's that connection I want to know, uh, want to uh, put before you today. Scripture authority is very important. Why is the authority of Scripture so much important? Well, you know full well that it says in Genesis 1, and God said all the way through, let there be light. And God said, let there be a firmament or an expanse separating the waters above and the waters beneath and so on, all the way through Genesis 1. And then it says, it was so. Now, when we actually analyse who is doing the speaking, we turn to our New Testament, which actually shows to us some remarkable truths which we are able to shine back onto the Old Testament. In Colossians 1, there is this wonderful description by the Apostle Paul of the wonder of God the Son. And it says, giving thanks unto the Father, in verse 12, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And then it goes on to say, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. It couldn't be clearer, could it, from the New Testament, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the preeminent mover in creation. And John chapter 1 says the same. It says, without him was not anything made that was made, in John chapter 1 verse 3. So when we consider the power of Christ's spoken word in creation, we need to realize that actually he was the agent primarily and he used his word to speak everything into existence. Now, in case we fall into some error here, we should never always remember that the Trinity is involved. Because the Lord Jesus said on one occasion, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And Hebrews chapter 1 says, he is the express image of God. In, John, in Genesis 1, it says the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. It also says a bit later on in Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our own image. So the Trinity is actually there. The Spirit is there. The Father is there. 
But it's the delight of the Trinity to always, or the delight of Father and Holy Spirit, to always emphasize Christ. Now, once we have this in place, we have a key to unlock Genesis 1. Because the prime mover is Christ and his word. Now we consider Christ and his word 2,000 years ago. And did it take a process of time? To heal the man who was brought through the roof in Matthew, Mark chapter 2? Or how long did it take for the Lord Jesus to calm the storm on the Lake of Galilee? Were the disciples looking at their watches if they'd had any? Of course not. It was an immediate effect. And it's the power of Christ and his word which hits you in the Gospels. We have never seen anything like this, the disciples said. On another occasion, no man spake like this man. You see, when we have an elevated view of our Saviour in our minds, there can be little doubt as to what was taking place in Genesis 1. Same person, same agency, the Word of God, let there be lights. There was no process. It was an immediate effect. Let there be an, ex uh, an expanse in the middle of the waters. And immediately it took place. So when it came to the sixth day and the creatures were made, it was instantaneous. Man arose out of the dust in a moment. We need to have that in our thinking. Process is not written in Genesis 1. The emphasis is on the word of God. Now, I know people have problems with the days, not you, but other people do, and we just need to address that briefly. I'm not going to do a complete exposition, sorry, a complete exegesis uh, here. I'm just going to give you the pointers because... Remember, the aim of what I'm seeking to do today is to say, look, these are the foundations, how are we going to then communicate it into the science? So I'm not going to labor this, but just to remind you of some important truths. The word, of course, is yom in Genesis 1, the word for day. And many of the arguments that evangelicals in the other sister parts of the evangelical church, you are one branch of the evangelical church which I very much respect and I've made that very plain but I'm sure you're aware of the brothers and sisters like myself who are in other schools of the evangelical church where we are being attacked by people who claim to be evangelicals and are promoting the idea that the days are not really days right now let me just just briefly summarize the arguments. I'm going to briefly look at these three questions. And just at the moment, I want to look at the matter of days. Why are the days 24 hours? Now, you see, you might say, but I know that they're okay. I believed Genesis 1. But the point I'm making here is that some of you may not have realized that you may be put into a position where you have to defend those days. It may be your own children are being brought up in the Adventist church, but they're beginning to say, Mom, Dad, why is it that you believe in creation? You must have a robust defense, and you must know biblically first why you believe what you believe. Now, let me just summarize it. Those days are days because, number one, there is an evening and morning referred to in Genesis 1. And everywhere in the scriptures where, Genesis, uh, where, where day is used with evening and morning, or with evening, or with morning on its own, it always means a 24-hour day. Let me give you an example. In 1 Samuel 17, you actually get a, a, a famous occasion where Goliath, by the end of the day, loses his head to a little stripling who was none other than... David. And you know that in 1 Samuel 17, Goliath, it says, comes morning and evening for 40 days. 
1 Samuel 17 verse 16. The Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40,000 years. Is that what it means? Of course not. It's obvious from the context that the evening and the morning is the giveaway. And it shows to us that the Philistine, Goliath, towering above everybody else, was challenging both in the evening and in the morning the, nation, the armies of Israel to give me a man to fight. And we know the rest of the wonderful account of David's victory. And that is the first reason. Now you could go through all the examples through the Torah, the Old Testament, where that occurs, evening with a day or morning with the word yom, or in some cases both. But you also get a list, first day, second day, third day. You've got a numeral attached in Genesis 1. Evening and morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. And this is another bit of exegesis which is very important. My first argument, of course, was much more to do with exposition. That it is the Lord Jesus Christ we can see from other scriptures which we shine on to Genesis 1. It's the Lord Jesus Christ primarily speaking in Genesis 1. And we used an argument there to say, look, there is, this is not a long period of time. These are, this is actually God speaking. That was the argument, the first argument. Now I'm using an exegetical argument on the, the basis of the word day. And when we get a numeral in every other place in the scripture, there's virtually no exception to this. In the Torah, in the Old Testament, where you get a numeral with the word yom, it always means a 24-hour day. Let me use, just bring to you one other point, and that's this. You actually get a most interesting reference to creation in Exodus 20. Now, I know this is your distinctive, and uh, you... Uh, have very good reason for saying that we keep today as the special day and there was no doubt that the Jews kept this day as well. And when we look at Exodus 20 verse 11 to the very commandment which I know that you respect greatly, it says in verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. There can be absolutely no doubt that the basis for keeping one day in seven is rooted in creation. And those who try to oppose the argument that I've been presented have to resort to some pretty tortuous logic to say that when God was speaking, and this is one of the arguments they use, that somehow he was speaking over a long period of time, or speaking, sorry, about a long period of time, but that he was actually referring to the fact that he was speaking in a week. And sort of arguments like that, which are putting the whole verse of 20, chapter 20 of Exodus verse 11 on its head. Clearly, the context is saying, look, the reason why I want you to keep a seventh day is because I made the world in six days and I rested the seventh. And he's saying it all in one breath. There can be no doubt that that is what is meant. Now, of course, people do have some problems with this position because they say, well, how could you have the light of the sun when, uh, sorry, how could you have light before the sun and the moon were made? You need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you, you know. And it may come from your own family. Remember what I said? You need to immediately be able to answer that. What is the answer? I don't know what the light was, number one. But number two, I have every reason to believe that God is able to produce light without the sun and the moon. Can I prove that from Scripture? Yes. Absolutely. Matthew chapter 17. Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses with the Lord Jesus Christ shining. What did they shine with? Certainly not with the moon or the sun. It was evident that it was the light of the Lord Jesus himself. And when we turn to Revelation 21, 
we are told expressly that in terms of the new earth and the new heaven, there will be no need for the sun there. And then it gives you the reason. Because the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the light of that place. Could, be not, could, could not be more apposite, could it? Okay, it's not talking about our present world, but it's talking about a world to come where there will be no need for the sun because there will be a light from the Lord himself. And what did the sky shine with? when the shepherds saw the bright light and the glory of God in the highest at the announcement of the birth of Christ. Who knows what it was, but it certainly wasn't the sun and the moon. You see what I'm saying? The Lord does not need the light of the sun and the moon to shine. And then one last point which is often raised is, well, what of 2 Peter 3, 8, with the Lord... Um, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. You know, so many people have used that quite incorrectly. Because if I was to ask pastors here and Christian leaders who are looking after their flock, what is Peter about? The letters of Peter, first and second Peter. And, sorry, this little thing is falling off my ear. I must have small ears. I must have evolved differently in the United Kingdom. Um, <laughs> what is 1 and 2 Peter about? It's about an encouraging writing to persecuted believers. That's what they're about. In Peter's day, Nero and other evil emperors were totally against the Christians. They were being torched, some of them even in Nero's garden, right? Peter writes to these persecuted Christians, hold on, God is outside time. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Indeed, there's a lovely psalm written by Moses, and it's Psalm 90. And it's the only psalm that we have written by uh, Moses. And he says in that psalm that the days of our years are threescore years and ten. It's that particular psalm. And he then goes on to say, so teach us to number our days. But then he says, Our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. And then he says a little bit earlier in uh, uh, Psalm 90 verse 4, A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So how interesting that Psalm 90, another writing of Moses, gives us the understanding to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. So we're using exposition now from the old to the new. And what it's showing to us is what we can always see. We can see immediately as we read Peter properly and his letters. That it's just simply saying that God is outside time. Now I mentioned this because so many people refuse to accept the days to be real days. I'll tell you something else that they refuse to accept. They refuse to accept that dust really means dust. Man was not made from pre-existing creatures. The Bible tells me he was made from dust. God breathes into the dust of the ground. That is why Adam's name is Adam, because he was made from the dust. This just brings me, and I'm going to mention that dust in a moment, in a moment again, but let me just bring, bring you to my second point, and that is this, that the history of the world is, the, is recorded accurately in the Bible. Now, I've been having a delightful time with Dr. Brandstater, who's not only been telling me about his interest in Genesis, 
but also his interest in Exodus. And I'm looking forward to possibly meeting experts who've really thought through the matter of the Exodus and when it occurred. In other words, the Bible isn't just talking about beginnings, it's talking about the true history of what happened. The Bible is unique in that it has a timeline running all the way through, telling us where we've come from, how things worked out at the major points in history, the fact that we are here, and the, most of us here, probably not all, but some of us, uh, some will be from other uh, descendants, but most of us are descendants of Japheth here. Some of you will be descendants of Ham, and there may be some here who are descendants of Shem. But how interesting, when you understand where you come from, and then it tells us where we're going. And there's no other book like it. You see, the timeline of the world is that one on the uh, screen there. The idea that we've come uh, over billions of years to where we are now, and then we're sort of an insignificant little blob right at the end of time. Have you been to museums where they liken it to a clock, and they say that most of history has been going on for the well, they usually talk about one clock face, so it's 12 hours. And they will then say that we came onto the scene in the last few seconds of the last minute of those 12 hours. But of course, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that we are created, that there was a fall, that there was a flood, that there was a, the beginnings of Abraham, of course, and the nation of Israel. Then finally Christ comes and the gospel and we await his return. And that our forefathers didn't occur just at the last few seconds in the analogy I just used. But actually that they were made in the beginning. Matthew 19 verse 4 says, with the Lord speaking about marriage and divorce, he says, do you not? Do you not realize that male and female, we were created in the beginning? Not in the middle, but in the beginning. So the Lord Jesus underlines the fact that we are made in the beginning. And when you actually work out the genealogies of Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, I found it such a blessing when I was preparing to write my book here, Genesis for Today, I found it such a blessing to go through the genealogies and to realize that those genealogies were unique. In Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, it's roughly a thousand years from the beginning of Adam to the beginning of Noah's life. Beginning of Noah to the beginning of Abraham's life, another thousand years. And then another thousand years from Abraham to David. There is a clock of history running all the way through the Bible. That is... I find very, very helpful because it means that when we get that history in place, that Adam is not so far distant from us as we might have thought. The flood is roughly four and a half thousand years ago. A rough generation is about 30 years on a uh, on this morning, at this hour, can you put 30 into 4,500? I'm sure you can. And you will get 150. In other words, the Bible is saying in rough terms, it's about 150 generations to go from you back to the flood. And in case you don't believe that, um, sorry, that's a video that somebody took of the flood, but uh, we'll just skip that one. <laughs> that, of course, is not true. I was just joking. But we'll just, just, I will show you back here. If you find that difficult to accept about that 150 generations, just look at this population graph. Here we are near just over 7 billion. When we come back to the time of the Second World War, when you graciously came in and helped us, as we were struggling with Hitler, that's at about 2 billion for the world population. Then if you go further back to the Napoleonic times, it comes down to about 1 billion. When you come down to the time of Christ, estimated of course, it's about half a billion. Everything is telling you 
that the world population is consistent with us coming out from Noah's Ark roughly 4,500 years ago. Everything's consistent. In fact, if you turn this on its head, if we have been here for 200,000 years as Homo sapiens, which is the sort of traditional evolutionary view, they might extend it a little bit more, but I'm trying to be, for their sakes, a little bit conservative this way. That is, not give them too many years, because they run into a problem. If the population of Homo sapiens had really got going 100, 000, or one or 200,000 years ago, the world population would be loads more than 7 billion. It's about 2% growth per year. And that figure hard, barely alters. It's been the ca that case for a long, long time. I find that very interesting. So, of course, we accept then a worldwide flood 4,500 years ago. And it's interesting that Peter says that the world that then was perished. There was an old world which was destroyed by water. Now, once we have that in place, that's going to be very pertinent when we come to looking at the rocks. And when we start looking at anthropology, we shouldn't be surprised to find that many civilizations, all listed along the top here, actually have a memory in their old writings and in their old verbal uh, connections with their ancestors. That latter particularly occurs with the Aborigines who didn't actually write things down. But they have long memories that in the past there was destruction by water. There was a time when humans were saved by building an ark. These three things are all found in all these traditions except one or two here, one or two gaps here. But in the main, all these traditions, all these uh, peoples have a memory of that flood. And just, just to uh, point out that the Epic of Gilgamesh, which many people try to say is the real uh, memory of what happened, and that that is the true account and the Bible is a corruption, it doesn't work because they talk about a cube for their ark, seven stories high. Whereas the biblical ark, of course, is 400, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, three stories, and nautical engineers, not naughty engineers, but nautical engineers, people who deal with boats, actually have shown that it would be stable in the very rough seas. I thought Dr. Brandstater would be interested in this. Somebody has recently brought to light something which was found by Dr. Hermann Hilprecht in 1909. This has been lying fallow for many years, but has only recently come to light again. And people have re-looked at this very old tablet, which is not the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's actually written earlier than the Gilgamesh story, but it's not biblical. People have translated it, and this is how it translates. And it's wonderfully consistent with what the Bible says, not what the Epic of Gilgamesh says. The springs of the deep will I open, a flood will I send, which will affect all of mankind at once. But seek thou deliverance before the flood breaks forth, for all over, over all living beings, however many there are, will I bring annihilation, destruction, ruin. Take wood and pitch and build a large ship, the number is lost of the number of cubits for its height. A houseboat shall it be, containing those who preserved their life, with a strong roofing covering it. The ship which thou makest, take into it the animals of the field, the birds of the air, and so on. Everything is consistent. And what it's really showing is that the biblical account is the true account. Let me now just lastly deal with this point. And then I want to make some remarks about how we approach the science. One of the major reasons why biblically we cannot make any compromise and take no prisoners with evolutionary philosophy is the, position, is the matter of death. Evolution says death is required in order to gradually produce the creatures 
which evolution will wonderfully make by a long, hard process of death and destruction, natural selection operating on them. Evolution says that we came through a long process of death and destruction, but the Bible says totally differently. The Bible says man, Adam and Eve were created and death followed that creation. Who was responsible? Man was. Adam took of the fruit. And in Genesis 2 verse 17 it says, In the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. People who oppose my position and oppose the position that you take, then say, but Adam didn't die. What do you say to that? Again, you need to be ready to give a, an answer for the hope that is within you. You need to know. Because your children, as I say, might well come up with that and say, but Dad, Adam didn't die immediately. That's true. He didn't die physically immediately. But he did die spiritually immediately. And that's the answer. And this now leads us as to the real biblical uh, account of death. It's not millions of years of death and disease and suffering. The real account of death in scripture is that man fell. And the flood, of course, is going to produce an awful lot of death 1,600 years or so later. So it's, the Bible tells us to expect death on two accounts that the curse fell on the ground and thorns came up, and also that 1,600 odd years later, God wiped out the whole world with a watery death for most people and the creatures as well. Now, remember I mentioned that days must mean days and dust must mean dust. There's a further reference to dust in Genesis 2. It's Genesis 3, rather, when it says, After the fall, dust you are, and unto dust you will return. If you say that man was actually taken as some pre-existing ape-like creature, are you going to say that he's going to return to that ape-like creature? If you're going to be consistent with the argument here in Genesis 3.19, that's what it would mean, but it doesn't. This shows to us that dust, as I said earlier, really is dust, that we were created from dust. Death is both physical and spiritual. Revelation 20 refers, in that very difficult passage, which I'm not going to attempt to expound, and it isn't my place to do so, but you will know that Revelation 20 refers to the second death. And it makes it very plain that that second death is none other than the lake of fire because Revelation 19 actually refers to that lake of fire. So, we know from Revelation that there are two deaths. There is an implication of two deaths by the fact that Adam didn't immediately physically die. So let me now come to this matter of death. You remember I said God said it was so in Genesis 1. If you also look through Genesis 1 at something else which occurs, you'll see that it says it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then once we come to the latter part, it is actually seven it was goods. So it's making it plain that the creation had nothing out of place. There was no death. There was no nature red in tooth and claw. So the teaching of death in the scriptures is that man brought death. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21 and 22. And then it says that Christ brings life. So do you see that actually death, physical and spiritual, was brought by Adam and that Christ dealt with both physical and spiritual death, which I'm now going to show you, on the cross. 
when Christ died on the cross, there was six hours from nine o'clock in the morning when he went on the cross till three o'clock in the afternoon when he'd finally died. At 12 noon, the sixth hour of the day, the sun went out for three hours. During those three hours, very little was said. We know that from Mark chapter 15, verse 34, when it says, at the ninth hour, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And clearly the first three sayings of the seven sayings on the cross were uttered during the first three hours when he was speaking to people coming by the cross. He was crucified in a thoroughfare. He was able to speak to people. They to him. People were spitting at him. People were mocking him in those first three hours. But when it came to the second three hours, nobody spoke. God put out the lights. And Christ, in a wonderful act of redemption, took my sin. And he cried out right at the end. God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Spiritual death was taken by Christ. Then he cries, I thirst. This time he takes the vinegar. Earlier he refused it. But the act of redemption has taken place. He was no longer worried about being drugged. He then cries one word, tetelesti, done. It's a legal word. That word is the sort of word you'd use when you were doing a transaction in the marketplace and you say, that's it, the deal's done. That was not a cry of pathetic, I'm finished. It was a cry of magnificent uh, I can't think of the right word. Everything complete. Everything is done. I've done what I came to do, as it says in John 17, in that high priestly prayer. Question now is, why didn't Christ just get off the cross? If you have the view that God used evolution, and I know most of you don't here. In fact, 100% of you don't. But the point is, out there, there are Christians trying to tell me that God used evolution, that you can actually merge evolution and the Bible. You can't. Because now you destroy what happened at the cross. Jesus stayed on that cross for a definite reason. Because he had dealt with the spiritual aspect of death, now he must deal with the physical aspect of death. And he cries the last saying on the cross, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. John 19 verse 30 says he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Literally, he bowed his head and he dismissed his spirit. Which means he separated his body from his spirit. Which shows to us, by the way, that death is not annihilation. There's been false teaching come into the church from that angle as well. Death is separation. In this case, spirit and body. Spiritual death is separation of me from God forever. Christ had it for three hours. Only he could do, take in three hours what it would take me in eternity to bear. He took the double aspect of death. That's what happened. And Christ did that in order to gain me the right to a new body. When you meet me in heaven, and by God's grace, I'm going to heaven, because I'm redeemed by the blood of Christ, you will see a different sort of face. You'll recognize it, but you'll suddenly say, Andy, you've changed. I won't have ears sticking out. I'll have a bit more hair, and I'll recognize Bernard here, looking totally different as well. But my dear, dear man, I probably will look more different, more different to my old self than you will to yours. Now look, the reason I've mentioned all this is that I want to just say that when it comes to looking at the science, we've got to take a biblical worldview. So when it comes to looking at rocks, 
There's a whole talk I do on this, but I'm not going to do it here now. That's the geological column, which the geologists here will immediately recognise. The world puts those millions of years in the middle, which I don't accept for a moment. Because I know, because I've got biblical glasses on, that that geology has got to fit with a worldwide flood. And the talk that I do on this is to look at coelacanths, look at moths, look at uh, uh, dragonflies, look at horseshoe crabs, uh, look at um, octopuses or octopi, I'm not quite sure what the plural is, damselflies, butterflies, and this one you can't see, but there's a feather trapped in there, and this one's a giraffe. And I would say to them, look guys, we can talk about the detail of the fossil record, we can talk about exactly what type of creature it was, but these are all recognisable as creatures we have today. Hardly surprising, is it? There's an awful lot of the fossil record, which is an example of what the technical term is, stasis. That you've, what you've got in the fossil record, you've got today. You've got some creatures, of course, we don't have today. Do you see? That that's the way to approach the science. The science can actually be much better understood once you have the biblical framework in your mind. And when I start doing talks on flight, which I often do, and when I debate, and I will be debating with Dr. Guerra, no, sorry, it's the other one, Dr. Yang uh, of New York State University on flight, I will be talking about the wonderful mechanisms that birds have to breathe as well as to fly. And I'll talk, and I'll talk about the fact that the bone structure of birds is unique because there is a clever little shoulder bone which has a little hole in to enable the second muscle which reptiles don't have and yet they say birds evolved from reptiles, to take this second muscle called the supracoracoideus muscle, which simply means a muscle which goes through the coracoid, the shoulder bone, and it takes the ligament through the coracoid in order to enable the humerus bone to be pulled up in a mighty action to enable bird flight to take place. And I will say to my colleague from New York State University, Where's the fossil evidence for the development of that little hole in the coracoid boy? In other words, I'm just giving you a little detail here. You don't need to worry about that detail from your point of view. What I'm saying is that when you actually get the biblical worldview in place, and I spent most of my time on that, then it unfolds the way to look at the science properly. And I want to encourage you, those of you involved in the scientific institutions of the GRI, and those of you involved in Loma Linda University here, to actually get engaged in using the science and not to be afraid of the science, but to go into the science carefully, thoughtfully, do your homework and show that it fits with a biblical worldview. I tell you, even though you may not immediately win over all those who are sceptical, who are clearly not, not really immediately interested, but may get interested in what you're saying, I tell you this, you'll lay a much better foundation for some of your families. Because I'm sure there are broken hearts here today. Parents who are saying, what happened to my son? What happened to my daughter? Why is it that they've not followed me in the Christian faith? Now, I know God is sovereign. But it's my duty as a parent to put down lovingly all the arguments and join the dots of my faith to show to them that it's only from the Christian perspective that all the sciences, all the arts, all the medical work that goes on primarily here at Loma Linda University makes sense when we actually have a Christian worldview on everything. What I'm really saying is that we have a manifesto in here for reclaiming the culture, 
for reclaiming the sciences, for reclaiming the arts. And let us be those who show to the world out there that the Christian worldview is a coherent worldview. Don't let the devil take away the sciences as though somehow it's his property. No way! The sciences were primarily set up by godly institutions in the past. In the past, Princeton and Harvard were set up by godly men. What were they doing it for? To give glory to God. We need to have Loma Linda with that clarion cry in our hearts. We wish to give glory not only to our Redeemer, as you could see, it's all connected with redemption, not only to him in his mighty act of redeeming me from sin, but also to our great creator. What are the two songs in Revelation 4 and 5? The second one is worthy as the lamb in Revelation 5. But the wonderful song in Revelation 4, thou hast created all things. And may we not move away from that, friends. May you stay true to the foundation of the Adventist church, which has always connected redemption to creation, and for which I'm very grateful. May that con long continue. God bless you all. There may be some questions you want to raise. I think we have a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so, for questions. We have several mics, so anybody raise a hand. Thank you. I know you're still trying to digest what you heard. It was wonderful. One at the back. Let me just turn this off while I'm... It's a bit of a distraction. We have discussed in some of our classes that we liken our religion and point out to the evolutionists that they basically can be handled treating their views as religion. What is, what's your opinion on that? I very much agree with you that, um, as I put at the, up at the beginning, evolution is not really a science. It is a worldview, a religion, which is imposed upon the science. And we need to actually point out to them that when they define science, and I'm going to use a technical term here, sir, for the gentleman at the back who asked. I'm going to use this technical term, but I will define it. They, they love redefining the science, and we need to watch out for it. They will use the term, but we must operate on the basis of methodological naturalism. Always beware that phrase, because if you don't resist them right at that point, you've lost the argument. Because they try and define science as only doing science without any thought of God in the picture. That is, we must find a natural cause, otherwise it's not science. But when it comes to origins, even though that may well be true, what I've just said, and works reasonably well for doing uh, medicine, you know, engineering and plumbing of the body. Uh, sorry, Bernard, I don't wish to deny all your wonderful discipline, but you know what I'm saying. Or I might use it for designing aircraft, finding cause and effect naturally. When it comes to origins, I can't do that because I'm closing off the option right from the word go that there might be a mind or a creator behind everything. So never let the evolutionist win the argument when he tries to say or even assume without saying it that science is to do with methodological naturalism. I totally agree with you, sir. It's a world view. Boscovich, it's really nice to have him with. I, I really must learn your first name, but it's a lovely second name and I can remember it. Danilo. Danilo. Da Daniel. 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 There you go. Danilo. No. Danilo. Daniel. But, but this methodological naturalism obviously doesn't hold even in sciences as a whole because we have forensic sciences True. which specifically focus on point. intelligent causation. Yep, that's a very good answer. Thank so you for that. So how on earth can people... Uh, on the one hand, speak of, well, we can decide whether this was a crime or not. 
but cannot accept the possibility, however remote, of intelligent input in origins. That's a very good point. Thank you, Daniel, for making that. Um, uh, forensic science obviously has to imply that things didn't just naturally get there and that the gun, you know, had to cause a bullet to, for the blood to flow and all the rest of it, you know, whatever crime you're looking at. If, if this South African who allegedly has killed his girlfriend, you know, we said, oh, well, that bullet just happened to go through the bathroom door, it would be nonsense, wouldn't it? So you're quite right. The, 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 when it comes to some branches of science other than origins, you're entirely right. And there is a comparison. There's a very good parallel, I remember that, Daniel. Um, that when you're looking at something which has happened in the past, you have to build a body of evidence together which does not exclude the possibility that some other intelligent agent was involved whom you've not yet suspected. Thank you. That's a very good point. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about your background. Could you tell us a little bit, were you a creationist from the beginning? Do you come from a, a family that... Uh, of creationists, or did you at any time teach evolution as fact? Could you make some comments? Um, everybody's different. Uh, I'm not like, um, oh dear, there's the gentleman who was converted through evolution um, in ICR. His, his name's come from me. I'm not like that. I, I'm, I cannot claim to have, you know, said, look, I was an evolutionist and then now I've become a, that's not my, uh, background. I was from a religious background, right? Uh, it was Gary Parker I was trying to think of. Um, I, I like to say I was a religious sinner, right? I married to a person, Juliet, who was converted from atheism. So she was an atheist sinner, right? And we have two very different testimonies. I was converted from being a religious churchgoer, but not seeing any significance in the Christian faith for me personally. So I thought, you know, I never really particularly doubted that there was a God, but I'd never understood that there was a personal God until somebody explained to me, Andy, you need to admit that you've done wrong. You need to believe that Jesus died for you personally. You need to accept Christ and commit your life to Christ, A, B, C. It sounds very simple, but actually it was a very profound effect in my life. Because once I grasped that Christ is personal, it transformed everything. That was just before I went up to university. And then creation became an issue afterwards, because I went up to study mathematics. I like to say that, that the king and the queen of everything is theology, is the king, and the queen is mathematics. <laughs> and medicine, very, very close, Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, mathematics, I loved it. But then somebody said to me, the leader of the Christian Union, now look, Andy, if you're a believer in the Bible, where does it start being the Bible? Ah, that made me think. It's got to be true at the beginning, hasn't it? And my wife, who'd come from atheism, she more strongly than ever had no sort of religious background. She said, well, if it's not true in the first few chapters, it can't be true at all. You know, that was her attitude. <laughs> and actually, it's still her attitude, actually. And she supports me 200% in this ministry because of her conversion. Now, uh, the point I'm making is that I realized slowly, Gee, this has got to be true. And then I started reading the book, not the Genesis, well, I read a bit of the Genesis flood, but the book which really had a big, profound impact on me was John Wickham and Henry Morris, The World That Perished. It was a smaller book, right? And I found that very, very instructive. And it was all about the flood. And it was all about geology. Even though I wasn't doing geology, I could see, wow, these rocks bear testimony to God's judgment. That's, and, and so everything began to hinge around the fact that the sciences must be consistent with what I read concerning science, even though it's not primarily a science book, in the Bible, okay? And so then I began to put roots down, saying this book must be true all the way through. So for me, 
it was a sort of a development after I'd become a Christian. I went into engineering, not into into the sciences where the major battle is taking place, which of course is biology and, uh, uh, and geology. But nevertheless, I later in my engineering started doing work in biomimetics, copying nature with a view to using it in engineering. And the work that many people perhaps may have Googled me on is that I've worked with the bombardier beetle, right? And I worked with a guy in Cornell who's sadly gone now. But uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the work that I did there was to actually copy this little beetle's mechanism for blasting out of its backside. And of course, then people started saying, well, he's doing that because he, he you, you know, he, they accuse me of being a creationist, which of course I am, right? And, but, but then they said, well, well, the interesting thing was that they then were saying things against me saying, well, you believe in creation because I'd written my book, Genesis for Today. But what nobody has not really stumbled on, and this is an important point, is that because I believed in creation, that's what led me to studying the bombardier beetle. Because I thought there must be a reason why this beetle sprays in the way that it does. And I found that it was all to do with the intricate valve system that that beetle has, which is tiny, right? The beetle valve system is less than one millimeter, right? And it has this little valve system, which enables it to squirt out a mixture of hot water, steam, and noxious stuff. And uh, I was just bowled over by it. And so my... Being a believer in creation affected eventually my later science. That's my point. Warren. Yes. Nice to have Warren John with us. Right. We appreciate your coming to Loma Linda. Yeah, kind of you, out Warren. of the way place for you, maybe. <laughs> anyway, I have known you for probably more than 10 years through what you've written, especially Journal of Creation. I've kept up on that. So I've kind of tracked your thought, but now I can ask some uh, more personal questions. You know, there is a debate about how we approach Genesis 1. And some of that involves my doctoral study, which I won't get into now. Um, some creationists say Genesis 1 is not a scientific textbook, but it's scientific. I think of Henry Morris and John Morris, his son, and so on. And if you define science in a certain way, then Genesis 1 is not scientific. As you pointed out, there's different ways of defining Genesis 1. If science is that which is testable and that which you can document through, the quotes, the scientific method, it's pretty hard to test Genesis 1 because that was an event in the past. In the past, yeah. And it also involves uh, laws that are beyond the normal laws that are working today. So how do you resolve this kind of tension between is Genesis 1 scientific or is it a scientific textbook? Because we often use it as a scientific textbook. We have to be very careful. We must obey the rules of hermeneutics, that if the text is primarily poetry, we need to be careful. So, for instance, there are, just, just to illustrate this point, when it talks about God stretching the heavens, I think it's 11 times all the way through the Old Testament. If it was just once in the poetic literature, I'd say, well, we need to be careful. But if it's repeated, then I begin to think, well, actually, even though it's in the poetical section, it could actually be talking literally that God stretched it to the heavens. And in Psalm 33, which says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That's talking about creation in verse 6 of Psalm 33. And it's every reason why we should still believe it, even though it's in poetry. So we need to be careful, be aware of the background. Genesis 1, though, isn't primarily poetry. It's just one verse, verse 27 where there is a repetition, male and female, he created in them, where you might say it's poetry, but essentially Genesis 1 is historical prose, narrative. So I say that 
Wickham and Morris are right when they say that the Bible is not primarily a scientific book, but where it touches on science, and if we're careful about the hermeneutics, you know, as to the type of uh, uh, words we're dealing with, we should respect it, and where it gets touches on science and history, it gets it right. So, because as we were saying with Daniel's point earlier, we are looking in the past, we can't, as you say, repeat the experiments. We can't actually go through it again. So we're, we're, we can't test it in terms of the scientific method, but we respect the scriptures because God was there and is a witness to what he has done. And I think we have to leave it there, Warren. But I respect your point. Maybe we're done. It's, uh, it's gone 22. Yeah. Looks like we have one last question or not. No, that's it. I think we probably ought to wind up. But thank you, Ken, very much. I much appreciate being with you. Yes, and we certainly appreciate your coming. Thank you for the presentation. Don't forget that his materials are down here, those of you who want to look. And um, I'm going to ask, Bernard, would you I'll close us with a word of prayer? Lord, we, we do close this meeting with prayer, but we pray that you will keep our minds and our hearts open, open to your word and open to your spirit. Thank you for Professor McIntosh's visit and for the passion he brings to his testimony. Lord, we worship you as our, our friend, as our redeemer, and as our mighty creator. We adore you, Lord, and we will worship you as long as we have breath. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all.